Now we've been um, studying forgiveness. The first, um, the first week we talked about judgment and um, how judgment interferes with our ability to forgive people when we're too busy um, worrying about things that we shouldn't. I think that forgiveness is a, such an important topic because all the time I'm working with people that talk about how they're hurt inside and how much healing they need to do. And I think that for most of us, that healing begins with forgiveness. We need to clean out our heart before we can you know, start fixing it. So that's why you're getting this, this series, um, because I think that the majority of the world is broken and hurting, and, uh, and we just need to, to get a handle on it. Um, last week, we talked about how God forgives, the ultimate example of forgiveness in the world. And we learned two things. One is that um, it involves some kind of sacrifice to forgive. And in God's case, it was his son, um, Jesus Christ, who had to die for us um, so that we could enter into eternity with him. The other thing that we learned that um, we can apply to our own lives, and we will later on, is the fact that, um, that God chooses not to remember. God can't forget, but he chooses not to remember, and I think that that's real important when it comes uh, to forgiveness. Now, tonight we're going to proceed and talk about our own selves and how we forgive, and this is when it gets to the nitty-gritty and the tough stuff, um, because we talk about forgiveness like it's, oh, just forgive them. And it's not that easy. We have a lot of obstacles within ourselves that we need to, to get past. You know me and definitions, so we're going to start with the definition for forgiveness, so we're all on the same page. I couldn't find one in the dictionary. It was one of those words, forgiveness is the act of forgiving, and you just keep going in circles with the word forgive. And so I did find a definition that I thought was, was very interesting and probably close to accurate. And this is a psychology definition. Um, usually I don't trust their definitions as much, but they say that forgiveness is a conscious, deliberate decision to release feelings of resentment or vengeance toward a person or a group who has harmed you regardless of whether they actually deserve it. And I think that's, that's pretty close to forgiveness takes grace. So if that's what we base our definition on tonight, um, it's complicated. It's not an easy thing to do. So does forgiveness mean you have to forget? And a lot of people say, well, I can't forgive and forget. Well, remember, God chooses not to remember. And when things haunt us and things bother us and things eat away at us, we can choose to let go of those things. And it's not always easy, but we can make that choice. And forgiveness is the same, is the same thing. Now, forgiving does not mean that you, um, that there's no consequences. Because Galatians 6, 7 says, do not be deceived. God is not mocked for whatever one sows, that will he also reap. Remember a few weeks ago, I talked to you about um, the young man who um, forgave his brother's murderer. She was forgiven by him, but she still had to go to prison. There was still a price to pay for her actions. And so forgiving doesn't mean that people get off scot-free doesn't mean you have to do the vengeance. You can leave those things up to God. But there's typically consequences to sin. And so there's also consequences to positive things that we do in our life, to good choices. We just forget to talk about that. There's consequences for any action. So, um, Carl, I'm thinking about you, and you're ready to spew out a... Um, uh, an action-reaction kind of a thing, aren't you? 
going right down the science lane. <laughs> so we're going to talk about some examples of forgiveness in the Bible. And the first one, I think most of you are familiar with, it's found in John 8, and it's the story where they bring the adulteress before Jesus. And um, way back in the Old Testament, you know, they were supposed to stone people that committed adultery. Never figured out where the guy was in this because it takes two to tango, but it wasn't about her. It was clearly that they were trying to trip up Jesus. And so they bring her before him and they talk all this trash about her. And, and this is when Jesus says his famous words, he who's without sin, let him cast the first stone. Well, of course, everybody, you know, walks away. I'm sure that they were kicking the stones, feeling angry that they couldn't get what they wanted out of it. But I think that there's another lesson that we don't look at. If we jump all the way to the end of the story, John 8.10 says, Woman, where are they? Has no one condemned you? She said, No one, Lord. And Jesus said, Neither do I condemn you. Go, and from now on, sin no more. I think sometimes we forget, and part of the problem in our world today with forgiveness is that we think we need to forgive things that we have no business being involved with. Um, Jewish wisdom teaches that only a victim can forgive. So if Carl does something against me, Charlie doesn't need to forgive him. It's between Carl and me. And so many times we get caught up in everybody else's business and we hold grudges for things that we heard through the grapevine or that we think we know all about and it just gets us into trouble. So when we're talking about forgiveness, we need to stay focused on that and we need to focus on who we're forgiving and is it between them and us. When we sin against God, we take that to God. When we sin against a person, we take it to that person. So I think that's one of the lessons that's in that story that we often overlook, is that she didn't um, commit a sin against anybody else that was there. I mean, we don't know if she was married, if he was married, you know, if there were spouses involved. I mean, clearly it was a sin against God that it was, you know, um, an impure relationship. But the whole crowd didn't really need to be involved with it. So, um, so that's just, you know, one example of forgiveness. Now, another one has to do with um, Jesus himself, when Jesus was on the cross. And if we jump ahead and look at um, Luke 23, 34, Jesus is hanging on the cross. The Roman soldiers are around and, you know, they're mocking him and who knows what else is going on. And they're even, you know, gambling over his clothing items while he's still alive. They don't even wait for him to die. And, um, and Jesus says, Father, forgive them. because They don't know what they do. We don't need to wait until somebody comes to us and begs for forgiveness. We think that, we get a little self-righteous and we think, well, they haven't asked for forgiveness, so I don't have to forgive them. Not true. Not true. And any sin that we commit against a person, we also um, commit against God. So we always need God's forgiveness. And Charlie and I talk about this all the time, that, you know, we're constantly before God, you know, for things that we think or say or, or do. But... Jesus forgave them, and they didn't even know they needed forgiveness. In their minds, they were doing their job. And I don't know that they ever realized what they had done. And, uh, but Jesus forgave them anyway, and he asked God to forgive them. That's the ultimate forgiveness, is when we can take it to God and ask for forgiveness when they don't. That's a huge step. Now, It's, it's disappointing for us when we think that 
forgiveness works in a different way, that they need to come to us, and, and we're going to have this wonderful conversation, and they're going to see the error of their way, because we didn't do anything to cause, you know, the offense. And so we get ourselves all worked up into these kind of uh, mental games. And the only thing we're hurting is ourselves. Because when we do that and when we overthink things, that just leads to disappointment. Because it's never going to go the way we think it should. And so it's much easier to forgive them if they come to their, to their senses, assuming they're completely wrong. Then, and they come to us and ask for forgiveness, it's so much easier to give it to them. And it's so much easier to love them because we've already dealt with that in our, in our lives. And I think we represent God a lot better if we can just give it to them when they ask for it. Um, sometimes it's hard. I mean, there are some, some things that have been done to people that are just, I mean, they're heinous crimes, but they need to be forgiven too. And so we need to be able to do that forgiveness before they even ask. Now we're going to get down to the tough stuff. This was the easy stuff. Tough stuff we find in Luke 6, 29. To one who strikes you on the cheek, offer the other also. And from one who takes away your cloak, do not withhold your tunic either. So we get kind of sick of that stuff, don't we? I mean, we only have two cheeks, right? But they keep coming after us. And most of the time, we probably like to think about the Old Testament verse, an eye for an eye. That Doesn't that make a lot more sense? But that's not what Jesus said. Um, if you turn in your Bibles to page 913, we're going to look at Matthew 18. We're going to look at two verses there. Because not only are we supposed to turn the other cheek, then we, then we read... Um, a little conversation between the Lord and Peter. Uh, Matthew 18, 21 and 22. Then Peter came up and said to him, Lord, how often will my brother sin against me and I forgive him? As many as seven times? And Jesus said to him, I do not say to you seven times, but 77 times. Well, some translations say 70 times seven, which is even more. The point is, you're not supposed to be counting. It, we're, we need to keep forgiving. And I think that that's really an important thing for us to remember. Um, our country is in a crisis with drug addictions. And people struggle, and they relapse, and they relapse. And, um, and I think it's especially difficult on families, whether it's parents and children or whether it's spouses and things. How do you keep forgetting, forgiving this behavior when it keeps happening over and over again? And I think it takes a special measure of God's grace. And it takes a special um, connection with God, knowing how to forgive that person and yet set healthy boundaries in our lives. But we have to keep doing it. And I think this verse tells us if they keep relapsing, we need to keep loving them. I worked with one person who had OD'd nine times in his life. Nine times he had died. And after the ninth time and I met him, he said, you know, God must have something special for me that he's brought me back nine times. And he finally got his act together. What if we would have given up on him at seven? He'd be dead. And he, and he successfully went through treatment and he successfully got his life together and um, married and had a child and everything else. But when we put limits on how often we can forgive, we limit God and what he can do in those people. So let's talk about why we need to forgive. Um, if you're still in Matthew 18, just flip the page to nine to 914, and we're going to read Matthew 18, 35. And here Jesus says, So also my heavenly Father, sorry, I just lost it. So also will my heavenly Father do to every one of you if you do not forgive your brother from your heart. I think that from your heart is real important because 
Forgiveness is sometimes a process that takes some time. And if your heart is trying to forgive, that's what God sees. That's what God helps you with. You don't have to be at the end, oh, I've forgiven this. It's not a big deal anymore in my life. It sometimes does take time, and that's okay. It's our hearts that God judges. Um, Jesus also taught us about forgiveness in Matthew 6, which is where we find the Lord's Prayer. And we're told to pray to God and ask him to forgive us the same way that we forgive other people. I want God to be way more generous with forgiveness than I've been in my life. And yet, I know that there are people who are able to forgive some of the worst things I've ever heard of because they want God to forgive them for whatever they're going to do. What a motivator. What a motivator, because don't we all want God's forgiveness in our lives? And then the last um, reason I'm going to give us is found on page 1081. That's the last bookmark in your Bible. And it's Ephesians 4. I think this is just really a good passage for us to live by. Let all bitterness and wrath and anger and clamor and slander be put away from you, along with all malice. Be kind to one another, tender-hearted, forgiving one another as God in Christ forgave you. I just, I mean, that's the Bible verse you should probably put on your mirror, put on your wall, so that you can see it regularly, um, memorize it so that we remember those are the ways, those are the ways that God wants us, you know, to use our heart. Now, another reason I believe to forgive is it's all about control. In our world, it's who's in control. And there seem to be all these battles, you know, about who's in control and things. Well, when you do not forgive, you have lost control. Because the person who offended you is in control of your emotions. Why would you give that away? Why would you let somebody else make, you know, make you feel bad? The way to get that control back is to forgive them. And why wouldn't we want to do that? Once we forgive and we are in control, then we can start healing ourselves and treating ourselves. So if you harbor childhood memories, if you're angry at a spouse, you know, from a decade ago, you have given up control of your emotions to them in that incident. And with God's help, you can forgive them, and you can start to move on with your life. I'm going to close with some interesting information that I found from Mayo Clinic. Because if you don't want to forgive because God tells us to, think about forgiving for your own health. This is what they've learned. These are the things that forgiveness can do for people. It leads to healthier relationships. That makes sense. Improved mental health. Think about how stressed out we are when we're dealing with all that anger and everything else. There's less anxiety, stress, and hostility. Forgiveness lowers blood pressure. They teach people that, how to lower their blood pressure by forgiving. I sat in on a class one time and, and listened to somebody talk about that. There's fewer symptoms of depression. So winter's coming. This is Wisconsin. We're not going to have any sun. <laughs> We're all going to be depressed. So clean out the closet and forgive everybody because our depression will get lowered. <laughs> we develop a stronger immune system. If you're sick all the time, maybe it's because you have all this negativity inside of you. It uh, improves heart health and it improves self-esteem. And aren't all of those things things that we would like to see um, better in each and every one of us. So let's just close with a word of prayer.